Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our live Bible study. My name is Emily Bartlett. I am an enrollment counselor here at, at the college, and I just love working for the ministry. It's amazing. And we're just very excited that you guys are tuned in on this Friday morning or whatever time zone it is where you're listening into. So I'm gonna quickly go through our announcements and then I'm gonna introduce our speaker for today. So this, if this is your first time tuning in, uh, we just really wanna welcome you uh, to the Live Bible Study family. And I'm just gonna go through ways for you to participate and <laughs> interact with us. That's one reason why these Live Bible Studies are so special. So as the minister is, min is speaking for about 30 minutes, if you do have questions that arise, we would love for you to post them in the chat section. So right now, whatever form you're listening in on, whether it's YouTube or Facebook, just go on to the, the chat section, start making your comments, say hello to everyone. When you have questions that do arise, please uh, put them in right away and they'll come right to me in the last 15 minutes of the broadcast, we will try to get through as many of these questions as we can. The Bible study is five days a week. We have different times, so that way, whatever time zone you're in, you can, you can pick the time that works for you to interact and participate. It's Monday and Fridays at 10 a.m., Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m., and really early Wednesday mornings here in Colorado at 7 a.m. This is all mountain time. And once again, please participate and interact with us today. Okay, so if, if this broadcast has blessed you, uh, it is viewer supported as well as partner supported. So if you would like to give back, there are a few ways that you can do that. There should be a number on your screen at 719-635-1111. You can talk to our partners, uh, partner ministry, ask them questions, see how you can partner with us. And then also there should be a donate now button at the top of your screen on Facebook. So those are just the few ways that you can give. Also that same number, if you call in and you have a specific prayer need, whether it's for you or a family member, a loved one, uh, we would love to partner and stand in agreement with you. I actually was a phone minister and um, it, it was just such a blessing standing with all of our callers. And there are constant miracles and testimonies uh, that come in daily. So when you do have that breakthrough, when you do have that testimony, call back in the ministry because we uh, we do um, we write those down and Andrew Walmack he actually goes through um, some of those testimonies so that is one way that that we can just stand with you as well now the same number um, if if there is something specific you are going through Andrew Womack offers well over 200,000 hours of free teachings free materials free resources I currently am listening to the, the audio teaching on um, the power of imagination. It's blessing me so much. So you can call in and you can ask uh, for a certain teaching that can bless you. Now, uh, the, the prayer ministry as well, it is open seven days a week. When I was a prayer minister two years ago, we were open only five days a week and we closed around 10 at night. Now we are open five days a week, 24 hours, and then Saturdays and Sundays, we're open from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, that's all mountain time. And the last thing that I am gonna share with you is that Andrew Walmack wants to offer this free teaching to you. It's a Karis Bible College course called Basics of Righteousness. There should be a link on your screen right now um, that you can go to, and then it will say, take me to my free eight hour course. It's originally $120. Um, so my team actually, we're currently on the phones right now. So if you need help um, getting that free course, if you're having issues or difficulties and you want to talk to somebody to walk you through it, call the number and go to the Karis line. We would love to, to walk you through that and um, just, just bless you today. 
Now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, uh, is Ricky Burge. He is amazing. I'm so excited to be here, and uh, we're excited for what you're going to share. Just a little bit about Ricky is he is the hybrid school coordinator currently, and um, just seeing him as I'm walking around through the school, he's always ministering. He's always making himself available to bless the students and just get to know people. So we're excited for you today. We're excited you're here. Thank you, Emily. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to be here too. And just for those of you who might not know, um, Emily is actually pregnant, right? <laughs> How many months are you? Emily? I'm five months pregnant. Wow. We we're talking about. I haven't announced it because this is uh, to, to be a blessing to you. But um, yeah, I'm five months pregnant, starting to pop, baby bump showing. Man. We find out in two weeks, y'all, if it's a boy or a girl. So. Yeah. Uh, we won't keep it a surprise, we'll tell you guys. Well, I know there's a lot of viewers out there that care about you and we'll be blessed to know that you're five months in. And, and you you're married to Josh the... Bartlett, which yeah, is Steve Bartlett's, Steve Bartlett's son. I don't know if the viewers have ever had a chance to uh, get to know Steve Bartlett, but mm -hmm. he was a mighty and powerful man of God. Yeah. Made a major impact on my life when I was in Africa and spent some time with him, did some ministry with him. And so she's married to Steve Bartlett's son. and so. It's awesome. The, I'm married to Joshua. He's the best person in the world. Man. Okay. All right. So today um, I want to talk about the subject of standing your ground, talk about how we need to stand our ground as Christians and as the people of God. And so I'm going to open up with 1 Corinthians chapter 16, um, and I'm going to read from verses 8 to 9. So it says, uh, this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church, and he says, But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So a great and effective door um, has opened to me. The Lord has opened a door in my life, the Lord has opened a door in my ministry, but there are many adversaries. And so there's, here's this weird dichotomy that the Lord has opened a great and effective door, but there's also many adversaries at the door. Um, and so the same word that we see there for effective um, in verse 9, it's the same word we get in Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, when it says that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Wow by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, Christ Jesus. Um, it's the same word as well that we get in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so it's that word powerful. So Paul is saying that there was an, a great and effective, a great and powerful door that the Lord has opened unto me, mm. but yet there are many adversaries standing in the way trying to keep me from walking through that door, trying to keep me on this side of the door instead of being inside of the room that the Lord has opened to me. The Lord has given me access to be effective in his kingdom. He's given me access to his promises and access um, to promotion and access to opportunities. But yet there are many adversaries trying to keep me from accessing the things that the Lord has opened to me. And so you and I as Christians, we've got to learn how to stand our ground and walk through the doors that the Lord has opened for us and not to be discouraged or limited um, by the adversaries trying to keep the door from, uh, keep us from accessing the things that God has given us to. And so the backdrop actually in this verse is Acts chapter 19. That's when Paul went to Ephesus and we see there that Paul actually had revival. Um, that's where we get um, that the Lord did mighty works by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that touched his body would actually heal people of diseases and, and cast out demons when it touched people who were oppressed. That's where we get that many people who were practicing magic actually took their um, books and they burned them and they put their, their, their books out. And so, um, I mean, people were being converted. People were being uh, changed and transformed. God was doing mighty things through the hand of Paul. But yet there were riots as well. Um, when when the, 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 I think his name was Demetrius who comes, he's the coppersmith or whatever, making the idols in the, tempest of Di the temple of Diana. And so there was a riot. All the people of the city of Ephesus says, no, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they rioted against Paul. And Paul had to leave the city of Ephesus. And so right at the same time, you're seeing an open heaven, let's say, in the city of Ephesus. You're also seeing open hell in the city 
of Ephesus. And so those two, God's kingdom and the enemy's kingdom were opposing each other at the same time. And so this is one of the things that's very important in our lives is that when God is working mighty miracles through us and in us and around us, the enemy also comes with his adversaries to try and stop the flow that, that the, 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 the Lord's spirit is having in our lives and in our ministries. And so sometimes great opportunities and great purpose in our lives come with equally great adversaries and ar adversity. Mm -hmm. So when God gives you a great opportunity, when he's got great purpose on your life, many times there's going to be equally great adversaries and equally great adversity trying to oppose the opportunity and the purpose that God has on your life and for your life. And so here's what I want us to understand. We cannot run from adversity because then we're running from our testimony. Mm. We've got to stand our ground. Nobody gets a testimony when there's no opposition or adversity or challenges, but testimonies come and they encourage us and encourage others because it shows that these things can be overcome. See, God's not necessarily going to just move things out of your life so that you don't have to deal with it so that everything is smooth. But what God is going to do is empower you, equip you, enable you um, to be stronger inwardly than the outward adversary and the outward adversity. And so we've got to learn not to run from our problems, but we've got to learn to run through our problems, mm -hmm. to run over our problems, to step on those problems when they try to get in our way, and to use those problems as a stepping stone as we walk through the door that God has opened for us. And so here's one of the first lessons that I want us to kind of think about and to meditate on. Number one is don't be an adversary to yourself. Don't be your own adversary because many times, some, uh, not many times, but there are moments in our lives where we are our biggest opponent. We are fighting against ourselves more than even the enemy is. And so Colossians chapter 1 verse 21, this is what it says. It says, and you, and this is still Paul talking, he says, you who once were alienated and enemies in your own mind by wicked works, yet now God has reconciled. And so that word alienated means to shut out from fellowship and intimacy. Mm -hmm. It means to be a non-participant. And so Paul is talking to the, the previously known Gentiles, right? The, the guys in Coloss, uh, the Colossian church, they were not uh, Jews, they were Gentiles. And so he's saying that previously, you know, you guys weren't in covenant with the Lord. You weren't um, Jews. You weren't worshiping the true and living God. You were worshiping idols and false gods and you were alienated. But he says that you were shut out from fellowship and intimacy. You were a non-participant in a relationship with the creator because you were enemies with him in your own mind. And so God wasn't the enemy of the Gentile nations. Mm. His plan was always to bring the Gentiles into back into relationship and fellowship with him so that there would be one flock and one shepherd. And so he was using the Jewish nation to kind of be a standard to the nations, but the Jewish nations were to be have open doors so that all of the nations of the world could come in and have fellowship with the true and living God. And so he says that you Gentiles were enemies of God in your own mind. God wasn't your enemy, but because of you, you thought of him as your enemy, that's why you were alienated. That's why you were shut out from fellowship. That's why you were a non-participant in the things of God. It's not because God didn't want you involved. It's not because God didn't want your heart. It's because in your mind, you saw him as an enemy instead of a friend and a father. And so the word mind there is, is, is talking about deep thought, imagination, mm -hmm. your understanding and your feelings. And so I want us to think about it. What are the deepest thoughts that we have? What, are our, what is our understanding of God and our relationship yeah. with him? How do we feel when we think about God? How does God make us feel? Mm. You know, what, what, in our imagination, how do we picture him when we think about him? Because that determines whether you're going to participate or not. That determines whether you're going to be in fellowship or you're going to be a, outside of fellowship. And we know that God wants fellowship with us. And so sometimes the only adversary we have is the one in our own head. You know, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is there a real problem or is this all in my mind? Mm -hmm. Is there really a real issue here or is, is it just my mind making up issues where there is none? Mm -hmm. 
Um, sometimes when you grow up where there's always challenges, there's always disappointments, there's always problems, um, even when there is no problem and you're a grown person, you, you just go back to that default of, man, I don't know how to handle peace. I don't really know how to handle love. I don't know what to do when there's no fight going on. There's no reason to argue. There's no reason to, to have problems. Like, I don't know how to be healthy in a relationship. And so I have to cause conflict and I have to create problems. And God is saying, don't be an enemy in your own mind. Don't be your own worst enemy, you know? Oh, that's good. Um, and so don't do the enemy's work for him. You know, we've got enough people fighting against us. We've got enough evil things in this world fighting against us. There's enough forces of darkness that are against you. You don't need to help the enemy by being against yourself. And we need to learn to agree with what God is doing in our lives. You know, sometimes we're just blown away and we can't even imagine, why would God really love me? Why would he want me to be happy? Is it even possible for me or I don't feel like I deserve it? You know, we've got all these feelings. We've got all these memories. We've got all of this stuff and we're enemies of ourselves in our own minds. Yeah. We're always making excuses of why we don't deserve something or why we shouldn't get to a certain place in life. You know, I'll never get there. I messed up so bad. It's just over for me. And you just got to start agreeing with what God wants to do in your life. Um, and don't allow your fears, your past failures, your misunderstandings, don't allow these lies to limit or slow down your progress. Mm -hmm. All right. So number one, I want to talk about how do we stand ground mentally? All right. I'm going to talk about three things if time's al time allows. In the first place, I want to talk about you and I being able to stand our ground is in our own minds. All right. Now, Timothy, I'm going to talk about Timothy, and Timothy had actually taken over the church in Ephesus for Paul. Paul sent Timothy to the church in Ephesus, um, and Timothy was facing a similar uh, kind of adversity that Paul faced, and so I want us to look at it from Timothy's perspective. So let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, and then I'm going to stay there in chapter 1, but I'm going to read verses 6 to 7. All right, starting at verse 3. He says, I thank God, this is Paul talking, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience yeah. as my forefathers did, as without ceasing. Now he's talking about Timothy. Now he's addressing Timothy. Timothy, I remember you in my prayers night and day, and I greatly desire to see you, Timothy, because I am mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. Now Paul is saying that, hey, Timothy, I know I can identify with the tears that you're shedding because I've been in those situations where you are. I worked with those people. I've, 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 I know the culture. I know the adversity that you're facing. I know that even though there's an open door for ministry and God's blessing us abundantly, yeah. I know the adversaries that are surrounding you on every side. And so I'm mindful of your tears. You know, some people don't think that leaders have problems, but leaders do have problems. Leaders are human just like everyone else. And so that's why Aaron and her had to hold up Moses' hand because Moses was a human being. He couldn't hold up his own hand and he needed support. He needed people to be on his side to strengthen him and to make sure that the nation of Israel would succeed on the battlefield because he had to hold up his hand so that the rod would, would give them, um, you know, the victory. And so we, even as individuals in our own areas of leadership, we need support. And so Paul is saying that, hey, Timothy, I support you. I know you're crying. I've cried. I know the pain that goes on at night. I know you're wondering why is ministry so hard? Why is life so hard? And he says, I'm mindful of your tears and I can't wait to see you so that I can be encouraged and so that I can have joy. And so Paul picks up in verse six and verse seven. He says, therefore, I remind you, Timothy, to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Mm -hmm. For God has not given us a spirit of fear mm -hmm. that causes you to cry and be, and be depressed and be discouraged, but he's given you a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind, okay? And so I want to talk about that sound mind. That's what yeah. um, standing our ground mentally, we need to have a sound mind. Now, let's look at a few definitions first. The word stir up there in the Greek, what does it mean? It means to rekindle the remains of a fire or the embers. Yeah. It means to inflame your mind, strength, or zeal. So I used to think that the word stir up was like, well, you got soup. 
that all the good stuff has gotten to the bottom. You got to put it on the stove and stir it up. But that's not what it says. It's saying that it means to rekindle the remains of a fire. In other words, don't let your fire go out. Yeah. Don't let the heat die down to the point where you're just smoking and there's no heat left. There's no fire. There's no fervency. There's no zeal. There's no strength left. It's like a charcoal at a barbecue. You got to keep moving the charcoal around so that you keep the fire alive. And that's what Paul is saying. Keep the fire of your gift alive, Timothy. Keep the fire of your zeal alive, Timothy. Don't d be discouraged and allow, allow the wind and allow the water of your adversaries to put out the fire in your life, yeah. to put out the fire in your ministry. Because because that fire is a consuming fire that will consume your adversaries and that will consume the adversity in your life. And so the word gift there is talking, it's usually I don't kind of pronounce the, the, the Greek words, but I think this one is important. And it's the Greek word charisma. Oh. And we know this is charis Bible yeah. college. Charis is the Greek word for, for grace. Yep. And so charisma is talking about a grace gift. Mm. It's a grace gift. And so it's favor that a person receives without any merit of their own. That's what it's talking about. It's the power of divine grace that operates on our souls by the Holy Spirit. It's that which enables us to serve. Spiritual endowment, extraordinary powers. That's the gift that God, is, that Timothy needs to rekindle. Wow. He needs to inflame. Timothy, you've got extraordinary powers on the inside of you. Timothy, you've got, you've been spiritually endowed. Timothy, you've got a divine presence in your life that caused, that, that doesn't even come from you, but it comes from the goodness of God. You didn't earn this. You didn't deserve this. Yeah. God chose you. You didn't chose God. God opened the door. You didn't open the door for yourself. And so you must receive this favor and allow that favor to ignite your passion once again, mm -hmm. to ignite your desire and, and determination once again, to say, I will not lay down and let the enemy walk over me, but I will stand my ground and walk through the doors that the Lord has ordained for my life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to rekindle myself by recognizing the, the, the charisma, the grace of God, the, the favor of God, the divine influence and power mm -hmm. that works on my soul. I've been spiritually endowed to succeed. And so you've got to rekindle that. You've got to keep that alive. You've got to keep stoking it. You've got to pay attention to it. Because if you don't, the thing is just going to start smoking and the fire is going to go out. But if you can keep stirring that up, then you'll keep yourself encouraged. Mm -hmm. And so here's, the, here's why that's important. It's because your gift is what actually does all the heavy lifting for you. Mm -hmm. God doesn't want you to do the heavy lifting in your life, but he gives you, he graces you with certain things gifts and, and abilities, and that does the work for you. I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He says that, hey, um, I've done more work than all the apostles put together, but he says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. And so it's God who works in us both to do and will according to his good pleasure. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus said, it's not me, but the Father does the works. And so we've got to learn how, um, like Ephesians 6 says, he says, we have to stand strong in the power of his might. And so stay strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There is a might. There's a treasure in this earthen vessel that will do all the heavy lifting for you. If you learn how to walk in the spirit and not try to do things in your own power and energy, then you will realize that there's a strength that maybe you've not yet tapped into. Mm. There's a power source that you may not have been utilizing yet. And it's deep down on the inside of you. Okay. And so please rekindle the fire and zeal of your gift. Develop it and make it strong. Um, now, the word fear, we're still going through those words there, and it says fear is actually talking about timidity, mm. being timid, um, which, again, it's about being intimidated because of adversity, having cowardice. And so, so a lot of Timothy was intimidated because the adversity was intimidating him. He was already timid, and so this adversity was drawing out the, tim the timidity that he was allowing to rule his mind. And uh, Webster says that timid, t timidity, if that's how you say it, it's a lack of courage or self-confidence. Wow. It's a lack of boldness or determination. Wow. 
So have you ever felt like, you know, you don't have the courage to stand up to the, the wind and the waves of life? Have you ever felt like, man, I just don't have confidence in myself. I don't feel like I can make it. I don't feel like I, I'm going to do why. I think I'm going to mess it up. I don't think I'm the right person for this. I don't think that God, I think God is making a mistake by trusting in me because I'm going to fail or I'm going to drop the ball. Do you feel like you don't have boldness or determination? You don't have, you that set your face like a flint and that no matter what, you're just going to push through come, 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 come what may. You're just going to push through the things that are trying to stop you and slow you down. That, that determination, that we, we as Christians, we got to have it. We got to have courage. We have to have a, a determination. We have to have boldness. And so um, God did not give us a spirit yeah. that causes us to feel inadequate. He did not give us a spirit that causes us to feel uh, a lack of boldness or courage or determination, but he gave us a spirit of power, love, and the sound of mind, okay? And I just want to talk about that sound mind briefly, and then we'll go to number two. But the sound mind is actually talking about a disciplined mind. It's a mind that is under your control, the control of your spirit, man. It's a mind that follows you instead of leading you. I like what James says in James chapter 1. He says, you should receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Mm -hmm. And so the word of God saves our soul. That means that our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, the way we think, the way we process information, the way we uh, analyze things, the way we come to a decision, the way we, like all of that stuff has to be trained. Your soul is like a child. And your soul has to be trained, it has to be disciplined, and it has to be matured. It has to be um, um, strengthened mm -hmm. because it's, it's a weak child. And, and so we've got to train our, we've got to use the word of God to train our souls to feel properly, to think yeah. properly, to believe yeah. properly, to make good decisions, you know, not to be uh, uh, lacking in courage or determination, but to be abounding in courage and determination. And so it's an issue of the soul. And so here's a few things that's important about Timothy. Number one is he was not a natural leader. He had to learn how to lead and to accept the responsibility of his position. Timothy was intimidated by people and responsibility, and his confidence was in his adversaries, mm -hmm. not in the Lord who actually opened the door in the first place. Wow. And so we've got to learn from that. Don't put your confidence in the adversaries who are opposing you, but put your confidence in the Lord who actually opened the door in the first place. Because if the Lord opened the door for you, he believes you're ready to walk through it. Yeah. And so we cannot listen to the voice of our adversaries. We have to listen to the voice of the door opener. Come on. All right? Don't listen to the voice of he who ad brings adversity into your life, but listen to the voice of he who is opening doors yeah. of opportunity and yeah. promotion and blessing and promise in your life. And so, uh, number two, I want to talk about how we stand ground on God's promises because God has given us so many different beautiful and wonderful promises. How do we stand our ground? You know, when you're dealing with healing and the enemy comes in with sickness and you just learned about prosperity and, and you get fired from your job or all these things, like how do you stand your ground in the promises of God? And I'm going to use Isaac for this example, um, starting from Genesis chapter 26. And I'm going to read from verses 1 to 3. It says, There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. And then let's pick up at verse 12 and read to verse 14. Then Isaac sowed in that land, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man began to prosper, and then he continued prospering until he finally became very prosperous. For Isaac had possessions of flocks and, and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. And that's why the Philistines envied him. And so here's the thing I want us to see. First of all, the blessing of God was not on the land, but it was on Isaac. Wow. That's why the scripture says in Deuteronomy 28, blessed are you in the city or in the field. That's why it talks about in Joseph's life, it says the blessing, God blessed the house of Potiphar for Joseph's sake. 
The blessing of God is not on the place. The blessing of God is on the person because you've been spiritually endowed. You have um, extraordinary powers. God's favor is upon your life. And so you can actually, you know, the blessing of God and the partnership of God causes you to become prosperous under the worst circumstances and situations. Mm -hmm. Isaac was living in a famine, just like Abraham, his father before him. And I, Abraham went to Egypt and he prospered in Egypt, which was the economic power and whatnot. But God told Isaac, he said, I don't want you to follow in the footsteps of your father. I can prosper you here. I don't have to take you to, you know, the America of your day or the superpower of your day so that you can prosper. But you can prosper here in a place where the economy is poor. There's no opportunities. There's no good jobs. There's no, like, there's famine in the land. And you can prosper there. And so God opened the door of prosperity and generational wealth. And the Philistines were Isaac's adversaries trying to keep him from walking through the door. And here's what I really want us to understand from Isaac's life is that we should not allow the enemy to intimidate or push us yeah. from the will of God. Do not allow, if God says this is yours, do not allow the enemy to intimidate you or push you away from what God has given you. You have to stand your ground. Yeah. God said, this is the land that I'm giving you, Isaac, and I'm not only giving it to you, but your descendants after you. This is a generational promise, and I don't want a temporary famine or a temporary uh, issue or a temporary insecurity to, to take away your focus from the eternal reality yeah. that I have promised this to you and your descendants after you. Do not let the enemy intimidate you and push you from what God has given to you. All right? And, and finally, as we close about to open up for questions, I want to go to number three and talk about how do we stand our ground in society? How do we stand our ground in society? And I want to look at Lot. Lot was a guy <laughs> who, he's, he's a very interesting character, but Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Bible still calls him righteous and says he was a stand-up guy. And I, I think that's amazing to his credit to live in such an ungodly place and to still be called righteous. And so in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 to verses 9, here's what the Bible says about Lot. It says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And here it is, and delivered righteous Lot. I didn't know Lot was righteous. Who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, there it is again, he's righteous, dwelling among them. So he's dwelling among the Sodomites and these filthy conduct and the wicked. The righteous man dwelt among them, but it tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord, uh, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And so this is amazing to me. Lot stood his ground. Can you imagine living in Sodom and Gomorrah when men are sleeping with each other in the open places and they're just sodomizing it openly. It's just, I can't personally imagine what that must have been like. Yeah. Even though we see things today and we say, man, today we're living in an ungodly society. Man, Sodom and Gomorrah was terrible. But it says that Lot dwelt among them. Mm -hmm. And it's, I like what it says. It says that he was, his, his righteous soul was tormented by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. That word torment is talking about it was tired down. It was exhausted with labor. It was treated roughly. Mm -hmm. Lot's soul was tired of defending itself against all of the ungodly things surrounding him. And that's what it means to stand your ground in society, to say that, you know what? God has planted me here and I'm called to the Sodom. I'm called to Gomorrah. I'm, I'm not going to stay away and leave the Sodomites to themselves, but I'm going to get in there with them and I'm going to live amongst them and I'm going to stand my ground and be a standard of righteousness in the midst of terrible ungodliness. Even though that's going to beat up on my soul and even though my soul becomes tired of, of fighting the good fight, that's what it means to stand my ground. And so, um, so Lot was unknowingly and unconsciously acting and living as a missionary. And, um, you know, it's God's heart and will for his people to move into the modern day Sodom and Gomorrah's of the world and stand their ground for the Lord. 
It really is. It's not enough for us to point our finger at people and say, man, these guys are ungodly, but we need to actually go to the modern day Sodom and Gomorrah's and we need to stand our ground mm -hmm. on behalf of the Lord mm -hmm. and say, the, the, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This earth does not belong to the heathen. It doesn't belong to the devil. It belongs to God and his people. And I'm going to go in there where it seems like the enemy has just exclusive right and privilege to do whatever he wants to do, and I'm going to be amongst them as a righteous standard. And so even though my soul will be grieved by what I'm seeing around me, their souls will be convicted by what they see in me. And so here's the last scripture I want to use to talk about standing our ground in society. And this comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 39. And this is Jesus talking. Now it says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And Jesus answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. And the field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. Now the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. So here's what I want us to see is that let's just look at if you were going to war, you look at the battle space and you make a battle plan. And then you say, here's our soldiers, here's the enemy soldiers, and here's our objectives and all of that. If you're playing chess, you look at the pieces of chess that you have and you look at how to strategically position your chess pieces in order to get to checkmate. And that's what the Lord is doing. Mm -hmm. He's basically saying the world is a chess field and the, the, the good pieces are seeds sown by the Son of Man. The bad pieces are seeds sown by the wicked one. And these, these pieces are lobbying and, and moving for position so we can get to the place of checkmate. And so God checkmates the devil and this ungodly world through his people. And he puts his people as seed into the field of this world so that he can checkmate the enemy. And I just want us to understand that, that we are the good seeds that God wants to put in this fallen world so that um, we can be like Lot and we can stand our ground on behalf of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so, man, we've got, a, we've got a lot of work to do. When God opens a door for you, yes, there may be adversaries, but walk through that opportunity. Walk through that relationship. Yeah. Walk through that, um, you know, if God is uh, promoting you into something. Mm -hmm. It may seem like it's too big for you. It may seem like you don't deserve it. It may seem like it's too good to be true. Mm -hmm. But if it's the Lord... He'll hold your hand and he'll take you through and teach you everything you need to know. Um, just use your faith and follow him. Yeah. Amen. Thank Amen. you so much. I hope you guys are being blessed. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into questions because we have a lot of really good ones. Um, so Rachel on YouTube is asking, how do you stand in faith after you feel like you have messed up again and again? Yeah, well, I, I like what, Pe what Jesus told Peter. Um, Jesus told Peter, you know, Peter's like, uh, Jesus says, well, I'm going to go and be crucified. And mm -hmm. Peter's like, far be it from us to allow you to be crucified. And, and he says, I'll never do that. I'll, I'll die. I'll even go to prison with you. And Jesus says, hey, Peter, this night the rooster won't, three times the rooster is going to yeah. crow and you will have denied me three times. And so... Uh, but he says that I've, nevertheless, I, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail you. And when you have returned, strengthen your brother. And what I love about that is Peter had a lot of faith in himself. But when he, when he got to the place where he denied the Lord three times, he could not put faith and confidence in his own flesh or ability because he had failed and he knew it. But what that did was now that I can't have faith in myself, I've come to the end of myself now I lift up my eyes and I'm putting all my faith in Jesus now because Jesus told me that I was going to fail, but he told me that he was praying for me. In other words, you're going to fail me, Peter, but I'm never going to fail you. And I want you to stop putting faith in yourself and I want you to start putting faith in me. Come on. And, and so, um, and after you've learned that lesson, you've returned back to me. I want you to strengthen your brothers with the same message. It's not about faith in yourself. It's about having your faith in me. And so that's what doesn't fail. My faith in me, in Jesus, will not fail you. 
Mm-hmm. So. Amen. That's so good. Yeah, Jesus won't. Even though you fail Jesus, Jesus will never fail you. Yeah. yeah. Amen. And he'll never leave or forsake. So we can run to him. That's right. Amen. Pyra on YouTube is asking, how do I stand strong when my heart is constantly troubled? Yeah, well, that's why we talked about um, standing your ground in your mind and not being your own enemy um, and not opposing yourself. And so, again, James, we talked about chapter 1, I believe it's verse 22 or 23. Mm -hmm. It says, receive with, with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Mm -hmm. Your soul needs to be saved. Your spirit is already transformed, is ready to go. But your mind, your will, your emotions, where you feel, where you think, where you imagine, where your memories are, the place of decision, that has to be trained up by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You've got to use the Word of God to train up that child of a soul that you have until it's mature enough to handle its emotions, mature enough to make good decisions, mature mm -hmm. enough to see things as they are and not as a false perceptions of what they could be, to not see things by fear, but to see things by faith. Mm -hmm. And so that takes some training, and the, what you use to train your soul is the Word of God. And so that's what I would encourage you to do. I'd just say, hey, if you've got problems where your heart's always troubled, it's because your heart has not been trained up. And so use the Word of God to mature and establish yourself inwardly. Amen. All right, Anne on YouTube says, how do we know if we're doing something in our own power or in the power of God? Well, <clears throat> there's probably a lot of ways to know that, but one of, one of the, 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 the things that I'm thinking about right now is uh, Matthew 11, I believe it's like 28 and 29. It talks about, Jesus says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And then he talks about how you will find, he says, take my yoke upon you um, and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and then you will find rest for your soul. And so he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's how you know. If something feels heavy and hard and it just doesn't feel right, it feels wrong, it feels like Man, it's taking every little bit of ounce of strength away from you. It's just zapping you of your energy. If it just seems like it's just taking too much of a toll upon you, on your soul and upon your, 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 um, your health and upon your relationships, and it's like, man, my, the quality of my life is just going down by trying to do this, that probably is a good indicator because his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Mm. That's probably a good indicator that you're doing it on your own strength and you're not allowing the Lord to do it through you and with you. And so the good thing about the yoke is that we don't just work, we don't work for God, we work with God. Mm. And that's what the yoke is. The yoke is a being where there's one strong bull on, on the left side of it and a strong bull on the right side of it and the, together they plow. That's what a yoke is. That's why it says don't be unequally yoked because if you're pulling all the weight and somebody else isn't pulling the weight, then you're, you, you know, you're not going to make it too far. But if you're equally yoked, you can plow the field and you can get a lot more done together. Mm -hmm. And so what Jesus is saying is that take my yoke upon you. In other words, I'll get in the field with you and I'll get on the left side and I'll let you be on the right side. And my shoulders are so broad. I am so strong that I can carry most of the weight myself. I can do most of the heavy lifting myself. And so that's why I said we don't just work for God, but we work with God. Yeah. We are co-laborers with him. We are in a partnership with God. And God doesn't want you to do things on your own. He wants you to do things together with him. And if you do, you'll know it because it'll be easy and light. Mm. It'll be manageable. It'll feel like it fits. It'll be, there'll be a grace for it. Amen. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, so uh, Karina is asking on Facebook, is there an appointed time for the personal blessings and promises to manifest or is it available right now? God is showing me constantly what he has for me, but I do not understand why it is not manifesting. Well, there could be a lot of reasons for that, but I'll just give you one of them. Um, and so I believe it's Galatians chapter 5 starts, or, or chapter 4. It's probably, I believe it's Galatians chapter 4, right? Verse 1, it starts talking about how though you be a son um, and though you are heir of all, it says that you are still under, you don't differ from a slave. 
um, even though you're master of all. And it says that you'll be under the steward, the, you'll be under guardians and stewards mm -hmm. until the time appointed by the Father. And so what he's saying there is that all of us are heirs. All the promises of God are yes and amen. Yeah. We are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. He has given us all things for life and godliness through the knowledge of him. Um, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Like over and over and over, we can see that the finished work of Jesus is finished and it has been credited into our account. But it says that though you are a child, though you are not yet to the place of maturity, though you are in the place where the father feels like it's time for you to walk into your inheritance, he puts your inheritance in the hands of a steward, in the hands of a guardian, so that you in your immaturity do not um, misuse it. And um, so you can't give a five-year-old child the keys to a Lamborghini. He can't even, <laughs> he doesn't even know what, what to do with the key. He can't even appreciate the gift that you've given him. He has no idea what to use it for because he's still a child. He's not yet mature to that place. So even though he's an heir and even though all things of the father belong to him, the father's not going to release those things into his hand until he gets to the mature place of being able to steward those things for himself. And that's how God does with us. All things are ours. It's already finished. But inheritance is tied to maturity. Mm -hmm. As soon as you can get mature, that's as soon as you can walk in your inheritance. Mm -hmm. And so the Father loves us enough to not give us something that we can't appreciate or use or value, mm -hmm. and also not to give us something that will destroy us. Because yeah. a five-year-old child driving a Lamborghini is going to destroy us, <laughs> right? So your, in, your inheritance is tied to your maturity. So just get in the process, and the good thing about the process is that once you get in there, it's only a matter of time before mm -hmm. you get to that place. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Well, thank you right. for your word, and thank you for your an your answers, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for putting in the questions today. But can you just pray over everybody before we close out? It's such a blessing. Father, we just thank you for um, the extraordinary powers that you've given us. We thank you for um, the spiritual endowment that you've placed upon us. Father, we just thank you that um, man, we have what we need to be ministers of this new covenant, that we, we are, there's a great treasure in this earthen vessel, Father. And I just thank you that um, we will not allow the adversaries to keep us from walking through the doors that you've opened for us in our yeah. lives. The doors of a good relationship, the doors of promotion, the doors of opportunity, the doors of blessing and promises. Whatever, whatever you have given us access to, Father, we will, we will push beyond the adversaries trying to limit and stop us and slow us down. Yeah. But we will walk through those doors with, with determination because our faith is not in ourselves, but our faith is in you. And we don't listen to the adversaries, but we listen to the one who opened the door. Yeah. And we just thank you for doing all of these wonderful things in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you everyone once again for tuning in. And Andrew Womack has an amazing teaching called The Power of Imagination. It's yeah. currently what I'm listening to. And Ricky was was ministering on how to stand your ground through, um, through your mind. And so I think that could be an amazing teaching for you guys to grab a hold of and listen to. You can call in the, the helps line for prayer uh, for how to access that teaching completely free. But we love you guys. Have an amazing weekend. And we'll see you on Monday at 10 a.m. Yeah, Bye. Blessings. Ready to develop leadership skills and expand your influence? Don't miss the Kingdom Business Summit, June 16th through the 18th in beautiful Woodland Park, Colorado. Hear from New York Times bestselling author John C. Maxwell and CEO Billy Eberhardt, Paul Milligan, Karen Conrad, and Dean Radke as they teach about success and business. Bring your colleagues to learn biblical business skills and grow your network. Register now at kingdombusinesssummit.net.